Matthew chapter 18. I hope this morning you've come praying. I hope this morning that God's will will be done, that I will say and do exactly what He would have me to, and that I will do it in the right way. So let's pray this morning, and I'm just going to say this like I've said it before. If I make a mess of this, you don't blame God, you blame me. Matthew chapter 18, starting verse number 11, the Bible says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray, even so. It is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you again this morning, we thank you and praise you for the day that you give us. Thank you for the way that you watched over us and took care of us. We thank you for every need being supplied. God, you've been good to us, and we know it's all from you. We thank you again for the privilege of being in your house. Thank you for each one of these that's made their way out. Thank you we've got this opportunity to come and meet together again to worship together in spirit and truth. Father, thank you most of all this morning for salvation. I thank you for Jesus and the blood that he shed at Calvary. I'm thankful this morning, God, that he left nothing out, he left nothing undone, it never has to be repeated. But he did it all. He finished it and it's forever settled and I'm so thankful for that. And I beg you, God, this morning, forgive me for I've failed you, for I've come short, for I've let you down. And Father, I want to thank you for the service already. I want to thank you for the time in Sunday school. I want to thank you for the time in the prayer room. I want to thank you for every song that was sung. I want to thank you this morning, Father, for just being able. We can leave right now and say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. But God, I need your help now. I need your touch. I need that fresh anointing from on high. God, I need you this morning to help me as I stand and try to preach because I know, Father, I can't do this by myself. I beg you, God, hide me behind that cross. Let people realize it's not about this preacher, but it's about Jesus and Him alone. Father, there's nobody in this world that I can save. There's not another man walking this earth today that can save. Father, let us always be mindful it's Christ and Christ alone. So let me preach Jesus. Father, I pray that you'd watch my mouth. Don't let me say it wrong. Don't let me lead anybody astray. Father, praying most of all this morning that if there's anybody in this place that does not know Jesus, save me. That God, you'd reach down and you'd convict their hearts, touch their soul, let them realize that being born again into the family of God is the greatest need that they have. I pray, God, that for any that might be watching and might be listening, I pray, God, that you'd touch there. Father, we know this morning that people can get saved anywhere after hearing the Word of God preach. Go with us now. Have your way in this service. For what you do, we'll thank you. We'll praise you. We'll give you the honor and the glory. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. When we look at this chapter, when we begin to look at the beginning of it, they bring children to Jesus. And in verses 1 through 5, those are actual children that they're bringing to Him. And He's blessing them. In verse 6, the word little takes a change. When you get to verse 6 on down, he's not talking about actual children, but he's talking about just small individuals. And you say, what do you mean small? Well, in the sight of God, how big are you and I? In the sight of the world, how big are you and I? Because the majority of the world looks down on God's people this morning. When it comes to size, you look at God's people this morning in comparison to the rest of the world. So we are God's little ones if you have been saved. And if there is anyone who has not been saved, God looks at you as little because you're smaller than He is and He makes it abundantly clear that He wants you to be born into the family of God. Now if you leave here without being born into the family of God, you will not blame it on Him. He's done everything that He needed to do. He's provided us with the Word. He's provided us with witnesses to preach it and to tell it. 
And He's provided us with the Holy Spirit of God to come in and convict our heart. He went to that cross. He paid the price. He shed that blood. So if I die and go to hell, it ain't nobody's fault but mine. If you die and go to hell, it's nobody's fault but you. So he tells us here, verse number 11, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think you? If a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine and go up into the mountains and seek of that which is gone astray? And if it so be that he find it, brother, I say to you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went astray. He comes back, that passage of Scripture is a lot of Luke chapter number 15 or what's mentioned in the first part of Luke chapter number 15. And he tells us in verse number 14, even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And that's why I'm telling you when he's talking about the little ones in that usage of that word. He's talking about those, us small ones who are nothing in the sight of God and it is not God's will that any should perish. He tells us very plainly if when you look at verse number 11 for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost, he mirrors Luke chapter 19, 10 when he said for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. When you look at verse number 14, it's not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that he's not willing that it should perish but that all should come to repentance. He tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 that he would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God does not want you to die and go to hell. There's never been anybody born into this world that God wanted to see <laughs> spend an eternity separated from Him in the place that He created for the devil and his angels. Again, I do not believe in, in Calvinist theology when it comes to predestination. No, sir, if we're going to preach it, let's preach it, right? Yeah. You say, well, what's predestination? If you're saved today, you're predestined to be conformed to the image of God. Right. God did not choose you to go to heaven or go to hell. If He did, then why are we wasting our time here this morning? Yep. That's right. And I think that's why a lot of people like that theology so they can take the monkey off of their back and say, well, if I go to hell, it's God's fault. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. He's come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now bear with me just for a few minutes. I'm not going to go in and repeat this sort of, and I didn't plan on this, but it sort of goes along with Wednesday night. I was mentioned Wednesday night that I am thankful for God's blessings. I'm thankful that when He saved me, He gave me salvation. He gave me security. He gave me a surety. I don't have to worry about losing my salvation. And thank God I don't have to wonder whether or not I've got it. Because these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. But this morning, just please be patient with me for just a few minutes. Yesterday morning I started out of the house. And I thought, dummy, it's cold. It's cold. I was going out in the buildings, going to gather up a bunch of trash. Went back, I got the coat. Then I thought, how are you going to get in the building? Well, I went back and got my key. <laughs> Had some cardboard boxes out there. I was going to need to break down. Go back and get your box cut. you got to have everything you need before you can get the job done. Right. <laughs> you can't go off half cocked. you got to get everything you need, have everything in place to know that the job's going to get done and it's going to be completed. He tells us in verse number 11, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Yep. Right. Now I'm going to mention, I'm going to just start off, jump in here, we're going to go on with salvation, but you need to understand, I'm not going to repeat what I said Wednesday night. So don't go to sleep on me and say I'll, I'll doze for half of the message. When He saves us, He gives us something that we could not get ourselves. When He saves us, He does something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. Like, like, that, like that phrase, those little ones, when He's talking not about children, but those 
who are small. Now, there was a time in my life that there were things I could not do for myself. I had to get, you know, I, I can remember when I couldn't, I couldn't cook a thing. Now, I can't make biscuits now. I can't cook like my wife. But if something was to happen, I could keep from starving even if I had to go to a limit. <laughs> but there's things we cannot do for ourselves. There are children who cannot bathe themselves. There are adults getting to the situation they cannot save them or they cannot, they cannot bathe themselves. There are people who cannot feed themselves. Yeah. And somebody else has to do it. Understand this morning that there's not a one of us in here that could ever save ourselves. So that's why God sent His Son to die on that cross. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He has come to save us this morning. Now, that was why He came to this earth. If God, if God doesn't change my mind and He don't move in a different direction this evening, don't try to tell you why He's doing what He's doing right now. But when He came to this earth, He came for one reason. And I know I've said this before, but just, folks, He didn't come to heal lepers. He didn't come to open blinded eyes. He didn't come to unstop deaf ears. He didn't come to loosen tongues so that people could talk. He didn't come to make the lame walk. He came to save sinners. Yeah. The rest of that was just, hey, that's just icing on the cake. Yeah. But His purpose as the Lamb of God was to take away the sin of the world. So when He saved us, if you're saved this morning, when the, the act of being saved came in, you received a gift, and that gift was salvation. Now understand this. You say, well, what does that mean? Salvation means either rescue or delivered. You were rescued or you were delivered. Rescued from what? Yourself. Delivered from what? Sin. Let me tell you something this morning, folks. Every one of us doomed to a devil's hell. Every one of us, not only sinners by nature, we were sinners by choice. We were sinners because we liked it. Don't die on me. Some of y'all love to throw back a cold. Some of y'all love Jack Daniels. Some of y'all love getting out in the world and acting like a gang of wild heathens. Yeah, you did. You've told me about it. So we were not only sinners by nature, we were sinners by choice. Yeah, right. We kept doing it because we liked doing it. But thank God when He saved us, He gave us the gift of salvation, and He delivered us from that foolishness, made a change in our life. But let me tell you something today. He said, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. You are saved by Christ and Christ alone, or you're not saved at all this morning. Right. You are not saved by the church. You are not saved by catechisms that you learn. You are not saved by confirmation classes. You are not saved by studying and taking a test. You're not saved by joining a church. The Bible tells us very plainly in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. It is through Christ and Christ alone. It is through this man, Jesus of Nazareth. It is through this one who was virgin born. It is through this one that went to the cross. It is through this one that was buried. And thank God three days later, came out of that tomb victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And His is the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved, where we can be saved, where we're only allowed to be saved. There ain't nobody else going to get the job done. Amen. Amen. Now, Brother Harper made a statement last week about Miss Mary. And again, I'm not throwing off on her. Hey, the Bible says she is highly favored and blessed among women. Right. It don't say she's blessed above women. Right. And I remember when Pope John Paul II died, he had told them what a marking that he wanted on the lid of his coffin before he was put away. <coughs> He said, I want you to take a cross and in the bottom right hand, I want you to put an M. And they said, why? 
He said, because if it hadn't been for Mary, I'd have never come to Christ. That's blasphemy. Right. Now, I ain't going to tell you that man's in hell this morning because I ain't his judge. But if it took Mary to get him to Jesus and not the drawing of the Holy Spirit of God, he wasn't saved. Right. Yeah. Now, say or do whatever you want to say. Right. It is not Mother Mary. And I'm going to throw this one at you. The Bible teaches us that if we're going to pray, we've got to go through Christ to get to the Father. Right. If you're praying to, to, to the Apostle Paul, if you're praying to one of the saints, if you're praying through Mary, or if you're praying to your great-granddaddy who walked close to God, you're committing blasphemy before God. Right. And you ain't going to expect them prayers to get heard. Yeah. Grandpa, please talk to Jesus and save me. That's not just foolishness, it's stupidity, and it shows ignorance of the Scriptures. You say, preacher, you don't think they can give you any help? There is one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. First right. Timothy chapter 2. Am I right or wrong? There is none other name. I received salvation. When I got saved, I received salvation. I received deliverance. I was rescued from myself. And you say, well, wait, no, 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 no. Listen to me. Again, God does not want you and He does not want me to go to hell. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation, it don't stop there, by our Lord Jesus Christ. God never intended the Apostle Paul to save anybody, and Paul didn't. Matter of fact, Paul didn't even want to baptize people because Paul said, somebody's going to think I'm saving on myself. I don't care what some of these cats say. They'll say, well, you know, when I get to heaven and I meet St. Peter at the gate, what kind of foolishness is that? Well, Jesus gave St. Peter the keys to the kingdom. And can I tell you something? Those keys opened the door. You hear me? If I'm wrong, you show me. He used those keys to open the doors to the Jews to salvation on the day of Pentecost. And then in Acts chapter 10... He used those keys to open the door of salvation to the Gentiles down in Caesarea when he went into Cornelius' house. Right. He opened the doors, let people realize everybody can go in. Nobody's locked out. The doors are open. Well, we can all go into the Holy of Holies. We can come before God through Jesus Christ. He ain't going to be standing at that gate deciding whether or not you're going to get in. Right. That's foolish. I'm going to get in because of what I did with Christ or I won't get in because of what I did with Christ. If I accept Him, I'm going home. If I reject Him, I'm going to hell. Yeah. And you'll do one or the other. Well, preacher, I'm just going to ride along and everything will be alright at the end. No, that ain't how it works. You don't have to do a blessed thing to go to hell. But you got to make a move. If you're going to get saved by the grace of God. So he is the only way. The Son of Man. Jesus Christ. He is the one that we get salvation. He is the one that we obtain salvation. That we stay away from right. Jonah. Even Jonah. In the belly of that big fish in chapter 2. He said salvation is of the Lord. Yeah. He knew. Even if I go to Nineveh and preach. I can't save these people. And it took a move of God. He preached. The hearts of people were touched. The hearts of people were convicted. And they began to look to God. They began to repent. They knew it had to be through God and through God alone. And that's why Jude tells us. Try to move. That's why Jude tells us in verse number 3. That little book, don't ever discount it because it's as small as it is. But he tells us in verse number 3, he says, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Now that word common does not mean cheap. Right. Now, when I was a boy growing up and somebody do something and it was just sort of trashy, for lack of a better word, and that was described as, man, that's just common. That's just common. That's just low. That's just trashy. That's beneath what somebody ought to read. But that word common he's talking about you know, common is used like an everyday occurrence. 
or a regular thing. He said, I gave all diligence to write of you the common salvation. That means that there is only one salvation and that common salvation is shared by all. Brother Jay, you know you saved? You got saved the same way I did then. Through faith in Jesus Christ after being convicted of the Holy Ghost of God after hearing the Word of God preached and taught. And if you didn't get saved that way, then you've got an uncommon salvation. You've got an unbiblical salvation. But the day I got saved, the day you got saved, when Jesus Christ wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, you received salvation. You didn't just receive salvation. You received justification. Amen. And I like that. Thank God. When God looks at me now, He don't look at me as some sinful, nasty, trashy, stinky, stench whose righteousness is His filthy rags. You say, well, wait a minute. No. Justification literally means we have been declared innocent by God Himself. Amen. Now you think on that one. Think on that. That's why Romans chapter 8 says, Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. And thank God for that justification. Thank God that when He saved me, I was justified by Christ. God looked at me. He saw the blood of Christ. He saw that, that I had repented of my sins. He saw that there was a difference. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter and he's talking about Jesus when he says who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Listen to me. It would have been one thing if he had died for me. But now that he's my mediator and he's alive, when I stand in the presence of the Holy God, Jesus himself is going to declare me innocent. Do you understand that word mediator? It takes a legal tone like an attorney. Let me tell you something. I ain't never, if I was to get in trouble and have to go to court, I ain't never going to be my own, my own counselor. I want somebody between me and that judge. I want somebody that knows him, somebody that knows how things work, that has no doubt about anything that's going on. And I'm thankful. That there is a Savior today. There is a Savior alive today. Yes, He was dead. But thank God He rose again for my justification. He can declare me clean. He can declare me innocent. He declares me as righteous before the sight of God. You say, preacher, Bible says in Romans chapter 3, there's none righteous. That's exactly right before we got saved. But when Jesus comes along, Thank God that's why the Apostle Paul said, I don't want to be found in the book of Ephesians. I don't want to be found in my righteousness. But I want to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Amen. When he looks at me this morning, I have that justification that only sat and being saved brings. And I am declared innocent before a holy and a righteous God. Now listen to me. Think about something in Luke chapter 18 with those two men that went down to the temple to pray. And remember, if you look back up here, in, in chapter 18, along about verse 3, verse 4, when, he, when Jesus said, Except a man humble himself as a little child, he'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. What did he say? In Luke chapter 18, they went down to the temple to pray. And what did the Pharisee do? The Pharisee looked toward heaven and said, God, I thank thee as I'm not that other men are, that I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all I possess. I thank you that I'm not like anybody, especially this guy right here. And what did the publican do? He wouldn't even raise his head toward heaven. But he bowed his head and all he said was, God be merciful to me a sinner. Amen. And what Jesus said? Jesus said, this man, this man, went down to his house justified rather than the other 
For that everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And for everyone that humbleth himself shall be exalted. When the Pharisees said, I've got it all in myself, and I've got it all in my works, and I've got it all in my flesh. Jesus said, you got nothing. you got nothing. But thank God when we admit we're a sinner before a holy and a righteous God and admit to Him that we're on the road to hell and admit to Him that there's no hope outside of Christ, thank God He'll move in, He'll make a change, He'll clean us up, He'll cleanse us with that blood, He'll justify us in the sight of God. And because we were willing to bow before Him and call on His name, thank God we leave this world. We'll go home and be with Him. Amen. Amen. The Bible, oh, and the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, as Peter's try, or as Paul's trying to preach, he goes in and he says, "And by Him all, a double L all." That's why the Bible says that in Christ Jesus in Galatians chapter 3, if it don't matter, male, female, bond or free, Jew or Greek, we're all one in Christ Jesus. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. But he tells us in Acts chapter 13, by him all that believe are justified from all things. From all things. You say, well, I'm a preacher. There's some things in my life. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth from all sin. Amen. We're justified before God in all things from which He could not be justified by the law of Moses. You say, well, wait a minute then. What, what good was the law? The law was that schoolmaster to take us to Christ. That law was to show me my unworthiness. That law was to show me my sinful nature. That law was to show me that I couldn't measure up to the righteousness of God. And that law is what showed me, Wayne, you're worthless and you have no hope. But all of a sudden, Jesus rolled in and said, Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And thank God, Jesus Christ, the hope of glory moved in. When we humble ourselves and confess that we're a sinner, put our faith and our confidence in Him, then thank God we received that justification that the only way we can get that is when we're saved. So when I got saved, I got salvation, I got justification. Let me give you one more real quick because it's already 12 o'clock. I got regeneration. You say, what do you mean? <laughs> thank God, Jane, what you used to be. He tells us in Titus chapter 3, he said, not by works of righteousness which we have done. I couldn't clean myself up. But what I said a few minutes ago, he's talking about those little ones, and he's not talking about children in that respect. He's talking about us who are too small to do what needs to be done for ourselves. There was a time I could not dress myself. I could not tie my shoes. Somebody had to do that for me. I couldn't get dressed by myself. I couldn't eat by myself. I couldn't go somewhere by myself. Well, I couldn't get saved by myself. So it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy right. in which He saved. His mercy. Amen. His love. His grace. Amen. Thank God for it. I heard somebody make the statement one time. I didn't come up with this for myself. But they said, you take a look. Define grace. And that word G-R-A-C-E, God's or our riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Thank God I got it all. And Jesus Christ paid the price. But by His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. There's a change that takes place when we get saved. There's a change that we could not do by ourselves. I just make that plain. God moves in. He takes away what needs to be taken away and He'll add back what needs to be added. And before God's done, you ain't nothing like you used to be. <laughs> hey! Amen. Ain't nothing! Amen. You say, I ain't good grammar. Might not be, but I think it's pretty good preaching right now. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 
regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Listen to me. We can look at Zacchaeus. Half of my goods I give to the poor. Lord, I'm at, just right off the top, Lord. And then if I've taken anything by false accusation, I'll restore it fourfold. But then you look at Samaria. There was a guy by the name of Simon, the magician. Oh, he believed. He was baptized. He was the preacher's running buddy. But he wasn't saved. Right. He might have been getting along, but there was no change in him. And he wasn't saved. That's the difference. When you get saved, you say you judge him. Don't you go back and you look at what Simon Peter said. Simon Peter said, that money perish with you. Mm -hmm. If he's saved, he ain't going to perish. <laughs> but we get changed and we get moved by the mercy and goodness and the grace of God. That's why, Paul, look, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Nicodemus asked the question. He said, how can it be possible for a man when he's old to go into his mother's house? He said, listen to me. Man as smart as you. Now this is the Stokes County translation. He said, a man as smart as you ought to be able to figure this out. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Nicodemus, even if you could go back into your mother's womb and be born again, you'd still be born sinful flesh. <laughs> and there would be no change. You must be born again. And the only way for that to happen is to be saved by the good grace of God. Let God come in. Make the change in your heart. Make the change in your life that will not happen until salvation comes. So let me get done. Romans chapter 12. And how many times have we heard it? How many times have we read it? How many times has preachers tried to preach it? And be not conformed to this present world. But be ye transformed. transformed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You say, what's he saying? Thank God when we're saved by the grace of God, we are no longer going with the crowd. Yeah. But we're walking with the Lord. Yep. We're not, all, we're not following the majority anymore. Don't say what you want to. The majority might rule, but the majority don't mean they're right. That's right. And be not conformed, but be ye transformed. Now, and the best way that I know how to say that, and you just heard it in the last couple of weeks, was 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Y'all can quote it good as I can. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are made new again. So the day you got saved, now you listen to me here. I'm about done. The day you got saved, you may not have received sanctification. Because God's still working on me. Okay? I'm still not perfect. But we should have made our mind up the day we got saved, that we were going to be set apart and sanctified for the Master's use. Now there's some things God needed to get out of us, or He did get out, He needed to get out of me. Y'all might have been just perfect when you got saved. But there were some changes God needed to make in me. Okay? But, the moment you got saved, you received salvation, you received justification, and you received Regeneration. Now let me just say this and I'm going to quit. If there's one of those you don't have, then you ain't saved. Mm -hmm. Well, preacher, I prayed that prayer that preacher said and I repeated after him. Hush, I don't even want to hear that. I ain't never, ever done one of them one, two, three, repeat after me and I hope God will let me keep my good mind and I never will. Let me tell you something. When we come to Jesus Christ for salvation, what we say to Him has got to come from our heart. Amen. You hear me? Amen. Everybody's different. The thief on the cross said, Lord, remember me. That publican said, God be merciful to me a sinner. 
Simon Peter looked at Jesus and said, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. They don't, it's not a script. It's got to be heartfelt. You say, well, preacher, I know I was saved because the preacher said it was. Well, his word and two dollars will buy you a pitch. <laughs> Amen. Now, I ain't trying to be ugly. But you know, let me tell you something right now. I can take the word of God and I can show you what it says you need to do to be saved. And I can hear you pray and ask God in your heart. But you're the only one who really knows whether or not did it come from your heart or just out of your mouth. Come on. Yeah. You say, well, I'm saved because I'm a member of a church. No, no, that ain't going to get it either. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm saved and I was baptized so my sins was washed away. The Bible says it's not, a way, not about putting away the filth of the flesh. If water baptism will save you, go home and take a shower. Come on. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. <laughs> but regeneration. That's the real test. Are you a new creature in Christ Jesus? Have you been changed? Have you been changed? Are your desires the same? Are your want to's the same? He said, hey, I want to save you. I want to save you. That's why I came. But when I save you, it comes all at one time. And if there's something you ain't got, then you ain't got the goods. I can put all the water I want to in that coffee maker, but if I don't put coffee grounds in there, all I got coming out is hot water. Right. If I got if I want a cup of coffee, something's got to be added, something's got to be changed. If I want to be saved, something's got to be added, and that is the Spirit of God that comes and dwells within us, that will guide us, Jesus said, into all truth. And it is that Spirit of God that teaches us how we need to live and what we need to do and how to get through the rest of our life. So listen to me this morning. Before I could get out to the building yesterday, I had to have my coat, I had to have my keys, I had to have that box cut, had to have it all if I'm going to get the job done that needs to be done. You're saved this morning. Then you know for a fact you've got salvation. You know for a fact you're justified. You know for a fact you have regeneration, that you have been changed and made changes that only the, the good grace of God can bring about in your life. Have you been saved? And that's all that matters. Even so, it's not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God does not want you to die and go to hell with the Lord. So you hear me, you hear me playing. I'm finished. I'm done. Do you know you're saved? Now hear me. I'm not your judge. And if you make a way to this altar and you say, Preacher, I've been a church member for 40 years, but I ain't really saved. Don't you be embarrassed. It's better for you to get it right this morning than to stand before God and hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. Right. Hear me. Don't worry about what somebody might say about you. If they ride with God, they'll thank God for you. Yeah. But one of these days, we're going to leave here. Have you been saved? Do you have salvation? Do you have justification? Do you have regeneration? If you don't, if you're missing some of it, then the job is not done. And you can't be half saved. You're either saved or you're lost. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thy heart God's raising from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 makes it plain that we're not saved by our own works because I don't have a right to boast. I'm saved by grace through faith. God's grace. My faith. This morning, please, please make your call and election sure. Know for a fact this morning that if something happens today, you're going home to be with the Lord. Father, as we come to you again this morning, we thank you, we pray.
for the day that you've given us, the way you took care of us and watched over us. We thank you, Father, for every blessing and mercy you supplied. You've been better than we ever deserved. We thank you for the privilege of being in your house this morning. We thank you for each one of these that's come out. And I thank you, Father, for the opportunity we've had to look at a portion of your word. God, I know this morning the message was simple, and I beg you, God, to use it for your honor and glory. Father, there's not a person under the sound of my voice that I'm able to say. God, all I can do is bring the word. God, I'm praying this morning that if there is anybody under the sound of my voice that's never been born in the family of God, that, Father, you'll touch, you'll convict, that they'll see that need and realize that need before it's too late. That they'll make their way to an old-fashioned altar, fall down before you, and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Father, praying this morning that if there's somebody that you might have dealt with many times, I'm begging you, God, give them one more chance. Give them one more opportunity. Father, just have your way. Have your way. So, Father, I pray this morning. If there's one of your children here that's walking afar off, might be in the middle of something they should, whatever the need is, God, we pray that you'll work and do the work that only you can. Have your way in this invitation. And for what you do, we'll thank you. We'll praise you. But we ask it in Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen.